Hello, everyone. Welcome to National Public Health Week Student Day. This is a day dedicated to all of you and supporting all of you. We have a lot of information to go over today. I know you all have a lot of questions for us, uh, but we also have a lot of answers for you. So we're gonna be talking about a range of different things today, everything from the importance of networking, um, how to job search during a pandemic, what that looks like, what kind of obstacles you may run into, and so much more. Um, and we're gonna have plenty of time to answer any additional questions you have as well. So you'll see a chat box below the video. I encourage you to submit any questions you have and we'll get to as many as we possibly can today. So I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Holly Plackmeyer, APHA Affiliate Manager at APHA. And I am very proud to be part of the team bringing you National Public Health Week programming this year. Um, a little bit more background. So I did graduate about four years ago um, and I definitely remember how stressful and how anxiety inducing that time was. So we are here today to support all of you. Um, and our goal today is definitely to help reduce some of that anxiety that you all might be feeling. So I am gonna go ahead and jump into our panel introductions because I don't wanna waste any time since we do have a lot of information to go over today. So first up, I'm going to introduce Manasa Palapalu. She earned her bachelor's degree in health sciences from Drexel University and her master's of health administration from University of Pitt Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health. And she is a current manager of patient experience at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. So we're very happy that she's here with us today and she's going to provide a great perspective as well. Also with us is Latoya Chimilio, who graduated from Texas A&M University with a master's degree in public health with a concentration of health promotion and community health science. She is a previous APHA Get Ready intern, and she is currently a COVID-19 case investigator for the Orange County Department of Public Health. So thank you, Latoya, for being with us here. Um, also with us is Zariah Buchanan. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and Africana studies and a master's of public health at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Currently, she is the suicide prevention epidemiologist at Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System and serves on the Arizona Public Health Association Board of Directors as the public representative. So thank you for being here as well. And last but certainly not least, we have my APHA colleague, Evelyn Maldonado. She earned her bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy with a concentration in land use from the University of Maryland. Last fall, she interned with APHA's Climate for Center for Climate, Health and Equity. And since then, she has been working as the current program associate for APHA's Client Center, where she primarily works on climate change and health equity. So I'm going to jump right in with our questions since we have a lot and I know you will have some additional questions for us. And I really wanted to start off with a question that I saw a lot of you submit when you were RSVPing, which was, how do you get your foot in the door? So with our panelists today, I'd like to start out just hearing about how you got your current jobs and what it was that you did to get your foot in the door. And I'd like to kick it to Evelyn to start us off. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Holly. It's an honor to be here among such a great group of panelists. Um, so, all right. Um, I want to share a little bit more about my background and I want to tell you all about my climate story. So I grew up in a small town in Quito, Ecuador, where a lot of mining activities were going on. And all of that waste was polluting our water resources and um, decreasing our air quality. So living through these experiences made me very aware of environmental issues at a young age and inspired me to learn more um, about how I could help preserve our natural resources, which is why I pursued a degree in environmental science and policy. Uh, while I was in college, I worked on a project with the Chesapeake uh, Climate Action Network and to determine best siting practices uh, for community solar projects in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Learning about community solar uh, made me want to look into potentially renewable energy careers. 
Um, but then during uh, the summer of 2019, I interned with Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park in California, where I was part of the interpretation team there. And I developed interpretive programs uh, about how air pollution and drought um, are affecting the trees. And most importantly, what I wanted to do was to inspire action uh, to help protect the park's resources. So at that point, um, I thought maybe I can become a park ranger and work for the National Park Service. Um, but, um, you know, it didn't go that way. And after graduating, you can tell that I wasn't clear with what I wanted to do professionally uh, until my internship with the um, Center for Climate Health and Equity at APHA. That's where I learned how to look at my experiences through a public health lens and to better understand how climate change is a public health issue. So this internship is what really got me, uh, you know, got my foot in the door for my current position, um, which Holly mentioned, I'm a program associate now and I help develop, you know, projects and I help promote the Climate Center's communications and program activities. So as you can tell, my background, a lot going on, but it was literally um, that through this internship that I was able to kind of start this new path in my life um, in public health. Great, thank you so much. And let's go to Manasa next. Thank you, Holly. During my time at um, University of Pittsburgh, I actually had an administrative residency with the local children's hospital, UPMC Children's Hospital. So with them, I worked with the ambulatory um, areas and was working on a variety of different improvement projects. So one of my improvement projects was patient experience. So, you know, what does what is the data showing? What are our patients saying about their experience? Um, at the hospital. And it was a variety of um, projects that we worked on to work towards access. You know, how do we get appointments faster? How do we um, make sure that the providers are accessible to our patients using our portal? So it was just a, a lot of great initiatives that I've enjoyed. At the end of my administrative residency, which correlated with the end of my graduate program, I was looking for other roles within patient experience primarily in pediatrics. So I was able to network and especially using my previous coworkers to help me find individuals at other hospitals. I was able to transition to my role originally at Children's National as a patient experience coordinator. So truly networking and uh, you know, using every opportunity to connect. Thank you, Manasa. And how about you, Latoya? All right. Hi, everyone. So I received my master's from Texas A&M. And during my um, master's program, I was kind of all over the place when it came to, you know, finding my area in public health. So I tried different um different areas such as such such as sexual health, um, children health, um, but I really found myself really engaged with emergency preparedness. And I think after I found what I really enjoyed, that kind of made it easier for me to, you know, find opportunities that aligned better with my with my goals. And so I found an internship with APHA through my um, the school career services, and I was able to really get my feet wet with APHA. And from that experience alone, um, I was able to land a position with the Red Cross. Um, I would say that my um, my opportunities have been very uh unpredictable to be honest with you it was a lot of no's that I received and it was a lot of networking with other people for me to land the positions that I've had and after my contract position with the Red Cross I was able to work with the Orange County Department of Public Health as a case investigator so it's been very unpredictable but um, networking has really helped me along the way Thank you so much. And how about you, Zariah? 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I think for me, it was a combination of like my background, which has psychology, Africana studies, American studies, community health education, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Um, so fun fact, my master's concentration is not in epidemiology, it's actually in community health education. Um, but when I went to, um, to school, I, I didn't like the word epidemiology. I didn't, I wasn't really feeling biostatistics either. <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm kind of nervous about these uh, classes, but I was somehow good at it. Um, and my, my mentors were like, you should pursue this. So uh, that's what I did. I set up my schedule to where I would take the maximum amount of epidemiology courses and biostatistics courses or statistical analysis in general. Um, and then on top of that, having experience outside of the classroom, within research, within data analysis, um, and things of that nature, the internships. I also worked at a psychiatric facility. So a lot of times when I was in interviews, people would be like, what makes you a great epidemiologist? And I'd be like, because I, within suicide, uh, suicidal behaviors and things of that nature, I saw people who were suicidal every day. And so being able to connect that experience with a human to the data and humanizing the data and making that story come out um, was one of the things that I probably made me stand out. Um, so always connecting the EQ with the IQ and things of that nature. Um, but really why I got into public health was the foundation in social justice. So anything that had to do with social justice, I was happy to go and do and um, pursue. Thank you. Thank you all. That's very helpful. I would like to dig a little bit deeper into this question and thank you for providing additional background, but I'm sure there's a lot of people on the call thinking like, you know, I want to get that internship. I want to get that entry level position, but what do I do to make myself stand out in the interview process? So I'd love to hear from you all what you think recruiters were really drawn to and what you think made you stand out from the crowd. So who would ever like to begin? Let's start with Manasa. <laughs> Absolutely. I think if you're applying to internships, or I know a lot of MHA individuals will apply to like administrative residencies or fellowships, really go on their website and see if there is any sort of contact individual. I remember um, when I was applying to like administrative fellowship, you usually could reach out to the current fellows to learn more about the role. I think that's really how you get to know the organization and get to know the role um, and start building that networking connection. Um, so highly encourage you to connect with any individual at the organization that you're interested in pursuing an opportunity. I think I'd have to agree with Manasa because um, I would say that reach out to, you know, that contact and also whatever interests that you have in public health. I think it's really important to, you know, go out of your way to um, go to the website that you care for and really seek out those people, um, even if they may not have an opportunity for you at that very moment in time, they will remember that, oh, you know, you sought them out. So I think um, going the extra mile. Also, I would also recommend um, your willingness to learn. Uh, that is something that's, that really helped me, I would say. Uh, after I graduated, I was really I would say eager to, you know, get the um, any skills that I can get, whether it was through internships, whether it was through volunteer, I gave myself at least, you know, six months to do internships and volunteers to really help my resume since I knew that I didn't have those experiences that they were looking for. I think um, internships and volunteering really helped me out in that sense. Yeah, I was just going to pick. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, everyone. No, I was just going to piggyback on that because that's my experience as well. After graduating, you know, I was excited and I was like, you know, I'm going to go conquer the world now. But then unfortunately, COVID hit at the same, not at the same time, but right after um, I graduated. And, you know, it was it was difficult because I knew already after graduating, you know, they've 
already had advised me that, you know, it's going to take you some time um, to find a job. But then with COVID, it was like an extra thing added to that. So it, it took me some time to find, um, you know, a job. And that is why I would definitely recommend um, if you have the opportunity, look, maybe um, step back for a little, because I know I just jump in straight to just look for a job. But if you have the opportunity to start from like volunteer work or an internship, um, I would recommend doing that as well. Yeah, I agree with everything everyone has said. Um, definitely research the organization that you're applying to and also know what you bring to the table. Um, if you can point out what you bring to the table and, and uh, let the people know that this will be a bi-directional learning process, like Latoya uh, mentioned, it'd be great. <laughs> you know, you have things to bring to the table, new perspective. Um, and I've always been told by my professors, you know, when you have a seat at the table, you use your voice. Uh, so show them that you will. Yeah, thank you all. There is something that I believe it was Manasa who brought it up about networking, the importance of networking and how important that is, especially if you're going into an entry level role. Um, just having those people in your corner is really important, especially when unfortunately you may face a lot of no's in this climate right now. Um, so Manasa, if you could expand a little bit on that, just as far as people who are just getting started, you know, networking I think is a really scary word to a lot of people. It was to me in college and it still is. So any advice you have, please share. Absolutely. I was um, in grad school, I was a part of a couple different um, professional like uh, organizations. So the main one was American College of Healthcare Executives and it had a strong presence in Pittsburgh. So I always went to their events and it was definitely uncomfortable at the beginning where you don't know anyone and you have to start um, building rapport and understand, you know, meet people from the very beginning. But after I attended a few events, I was able to form connections and really learn from other people that I wouldn't normally work from. Um, even when I transitioned to my role, I have found other professional organizations that I've joined and frequently attend webinars and um, any way that I can connect with other people outside of my organization or direct circle. So, you know, looking out for any sort of professional organizations that a lot of them are offering free webinars, especially in the virtual space that we're in right now. So anything that you can attend to just learn more information would be extremely beneficial. And I would add to like in this pandemic era, essentially, uh, if you can't go to events, so like Manasha said, go to webinars, but also read people's papers. Um, people put a lot of work into their papers. And most of the time I read someone's paper, if I have questions, I email them directly. They're like, oh my gosh, someone is reading my paper. And I'm like, yes, I am. So um, if you have well thought out questions, they might be impressed. And, email you back, but worst case scenario, they don't email you back. Best case scenario, um, they actually give you some gems of advice or they get your wheels and gears turning in your head about things that you wanna do as you uh, develop through this process. I would also say, since we're talking about networking, um, you know, if you do participate in these webinars, um, you know, send follow-up emails if the panelists have provided their information so you can stay in touch with them. And you can, I mean, I'm sure we can try that even with this webinar, like let's um, start with this one, you know, we can keep in touch after this. Um, and you, because like Latoya said, even if they aren't in the fields of interest to you, they can lead you uh, to people who are. So to uh, definitely take advantage of those opportunities. And just one more thing that I would encourage you is to request informational interviews um, with the, an employer of your organization of interest. Um, because unlike a job interview, during an in, informational interview, um, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. And you can obtain, you know, most of the information about the organization and, and the opportunities that they have. Um, and even though these interviews, they don't guarantee a, a job, um, they will allow you to find out more about the field and the role that you're interested in. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question is actually for folks who maybe their next step isn't going into a professional role. Maybe they're looking at grad school instead. Um, and I know we have quite a few master's folks on this call with us. So I would love to hear from your experience. What was it that made you a valuable candidate when applying to your master's program? And let's go to Latoya first. Um, so for me, I would say, so I, for my bachelor's degree, I um, majored in communicative disorders. I was on the road to be a speech language pathology. And so I really gathered a lot of experience with child development. And um, just from my experience um, in, you know, child health, I learned that it wasn't for me. And so I've tried to volunteer with the Red Cross, just try to get as much as much experience that I can from public health. So I think um, my creativity when it came to my personal statement as to how, you know, I landed into the realm of public health and my experiences with the Red Cross as a volunteer, um, really made me out to be a valuable candidate just volunteering and being positive even if it's not even if your background is not the most traditional route that you took I think um, your perspective on how you know you turn that information around can be one of the leading factors that help you gain um, a seat at the table. Soraya Manasa, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I um, I would also add, you know, everyone has a PhD in their own experience. And so like, and that's kind of what Latoya just said, um, you know, owning your experience, um, putting that experience in your work is really important. For me, my experience was mostly protests and uh, <laughs> rallies and things of that nature because I uh, wanted to be an activist and advocate. And so I wanted to pick a field that, um, that would allow me to be a professional activist, which is basically what I said in my personal statement. And I also just noted public health that surrounded me. And so before I even understood what public health was, I was so involved in it. Um, so coming to those realizations and only your own experience and that you have a PhD in your own experience is really important in the process. I echo everything that's been said, but truly figure out what is your why? What is your purpose? Why do you wanna go into public health or healthcare? What experiences have brought you down this route? And then what are you looking for in a program too? Not every public health or healthcare administration or school is the same. So for me, I was looking for a program with a thorough internship program where I can get real world experience. And like I communicated my why and, and what I want to get out of it in my personal statement. And I was passionate about it. So I think that's how I was able to get in. Thank you. Thank you all. So my next question for you. Um, so we all know, unfortunately, that a woman in the workplace can come with its own set of obstacles, but I'd like to hear from all of you what your experience has been being a woman of color in public health and any advice that you might be able to relay. And whoever would like to start. Go ahead, Evelyn. Sure. Um, so I am actually very grateful to be a part of a very diverse group at APHA and to work alongside strong professional women from whom I've learned so much um, about public health, especially on the importance of addressing climate change as a public health issue and its interconnections with health equity. Um, my supervisor, Sareli Patel, um, she has been a great mentor and she shared with me her experiences in this field. And one of the many great pieces of advice she's given me is to not be afraid to speak up. Uh, from my experience, having allies who understand your work and passion is so important to help you grow and succeed in your role. Uh, but wherever you find yourself working, 
remember to be confident and be proud of what you've accomplished and the unique perspective that that we bring to the field. Um, and I would just say, you know, if you're looking for jobs as you look for them, uh, it could be useful to try to learn about the organization's culture and any like diverse equity and inclusion resources they may have. I would say that my experience has been interesting. Um, I won't go into all the details, but I, I think like Evelyn said, holding that confidence is really important. Um, going in and go, going in with your own values, your own goals and sticking to that is really important in any process. Um, not just, you know, being a woman of color in the, in the workplace, but being anyone in the workplace. Um, so own your goals, stick by them. Um, for me, it's making sure that I don't operate from an ivory tower. It's making sure that intersectionality is always talked about. It's making sure I'm pushing the comfort comfortability of the people who are around me um, to think about people that we're serving and to think about BIPOC people, LGBTQ plus people, uh, religious minorities, so on and so forth. Um, because of my identities, that's why those things are important to me. And I just try to make them important to other people as well. Definitely, I would have to add to Soraya. Um, I would say that the three things that I've learned as a woman of color, um, especially when you work with high level leadership, you will all you will often, you know, second guess yourself. But I think, you know, knowing um, to speak up and not being intimidated by the titles in the room, you know, not being intimidated by the titles in the room and, you know, fake it till you make it because those rooms can make it um, make you feel as if you're not um, what whatever credentials that you have may not be valid, but it is valid. So those are the three things that I've gathered working, you know, as a woman of color. Absolutely. I appreciate what everyone said about culture and sense in that, and especially in the interview process, you can kind of tell where you'll be appreciated and celebrated. Um, and I think that's where I've been spent most of my time during my interviews, just to understand more about the organization, what they do by diversity, like it was mentioned before, just to really figure out like if this is a good fit for me. And I think being a part of a strong group of um, females has, has been so supportive. So I felt appreciated and celebrated and you know they challenge me every day but in a great way yeah those were all really great answers i think especially what a lot of you brought up is having that confidence in your voice that is incredibly important i know a lot of people listening to this call are undergrads or grads and being younger in the workplace um, you can almost feel like like, what do I know? Like, what do I have to share? And we all have something to share. So keeping that in mind and having that confidence uh, is incredibly important. Um, and I wanna transition to a question that kind of goes off of this. And it's all about challenges that you all may see affecting the next generation of public health workers, um, just from your perspective or a flip side to that one, was there anything that being in public health surprised you? something that, you know, people who are just about to enter this field may need to know. Well, depending on where you are, you might have to deal with a lot of politics. So be very aware that politics are extremely real um, and they may make your job uh, challenging, but you could always get over a hurdle or a challenge or what have you, um, but still stick to your goals and your values and you can make it through. I think another thing that this generation, like our generation of public health professionals, as well as the next generation will have to do is gain, I guess, gain our trust back into the public. I think some of that was kind of stripped um, with previous administration, to be honest. Um, so gaining that confidence back in the public is really important and will be crucial to how we're able to operate um, as a society and a nation. Oh. 
Uh, okay. I would say um, for me, um, I would like project management and building relationships would be, um, you know, two of the important things I would say moving forward in the public health field. I feel that after I graduated, I didn't have a lot of the, um, I would say, you know, the skills, the hands-on skills that were required, you know, such as Google Analytics, Basecamp, Salesforce, those things were just over my head. I didn't know about them. So just really, even if it's not taught in your program, I think um, really pushing yourself forward to gain those experiences, especially in internships and volunteer would really, you know, help. And then as far as building relationships, I think public health is a lot of building relationships. So I think, you know, moving forward, like Zariah said, um, you know, building those relationships and gaining the trust of, of, you know, the public will really help us move forward in our, in everything. <laughs> I'm excited for all the future technology of public health and healthcare. I mean, telemedicine has really shifted how we even look at care in the past like year because of the pandemic. So I'm really looking forward to see how that affects access and how patients are able to have more of a choice in regards to care and where they go to, especially with patient experience. You, you know, there's more options and depending on, you know, hopefully we can reach a more larger um, audience the future as well. I think from my perspective, uh, one thing that did surprise me, oh, more than a surprise, it was more of like, um, wow, you were here all the time, but I didn't know, it was the fact that how interconnected climate change is with public health. Uh, and so I think one of the most important things now is, or probably a challenge, is how, how can we integrate climate change and health equity um, into the public health practice? Um, so that was definitely one thing that, uh, you know, coming into, I wasn't aware of, and I'm glad I do now. Um, and so I think it's important that, uh, you know, we keep um, increasing awareness about these issues and lending our voices um, by telling our own story uh, to add to the climate conversation and to galvanize action for the next generation of public health leaders. So I think it's important to do that as we move forward, just incorporating climate change and health equity into the work that we do um, because climate change is happening now and it will continue happening. Like severe um, weather events are gonna continue happening. So I think it's important to keep this conversation um, going on climate change and health equity. Thank you all so much. Uh, so I have a question that I wasn't sure if we would have time for, uh, but I think it's really important to talk about, and it's all about addressing burnout. Um, so I know all of us, all of us panelists, we've heard that in regards to health and public health professionals, how they're really feeling that right now, but also our viewers, you're feeling burnout with school too. And now with applying to jobs, it can feel very overwhelming. And it's really important to be able to manage that especially since you are going into a profession where you give so much of yourself to others. So I would love to hear from our panelists what you do to prioritize your mental health. And I'd love to kick it to you, Zariah, to kick us off. Sure, I have a couple of things that I do. I try to maintain a good work-life balance. That's really challenging when you're at home and you work in like your living room and then your bedroom is like five feet away type thing. <laughs> but work-life balance is really important. I also um, am trying to get into having like a mental health day every month um, to make sure that I am taking time off other than the weekend and things of that nature. Um, also therapy is cool. If you have the resources to get therapy and now that the pandemic is here, there's a lot more free resources in terms of therapy and counseling. It's really important. Counseling and therapy are not just for when you're not doing well, it's for when you're doing good too. You exercise your body, whether or not you're sick, you should exercise your mind, whether or not you're sick. Um, really being honest with yourself about where you are mentally and asking for help, I think is um, a couple of things that I try to do.
All right, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Anything in particular that works for them? Something to add, um, Zoom fatigue <laughs> has been something that I'm definitely struggling with. Um, I'm in the office every day, but I think something with um, my coworkers that I try to do is mix it up and try a different location. Like, let's go sit outside at our patio or take a walk for a meeting instead of constantly sitting on Zoom or, um, you know, in an enclosed office space. So trying to mix it up, but also making sure that when I do leave work to kind of disconnect to make sure that I do have free time um, that I can enjoy with myself and loved ones. And I would, sorry, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I agree with both of you. I think what has helped me, um, it's still a challenge um, to, you know, balance work and, you know, life, but have taking breaks, that is really, really important. And also looking at hobbies that you normally wouldn't do, just put yourself out there and do them. I'm taking on skating. So, you know, different things and we'll see. And I was yeah. just going to say oh. to the people who are applying to jobs, I know sometimes it seems like if you're sitting down and doing nothing, then you're not actively doing something to get a job. Um, mm -hmm. That's not at all what is happening. You, you do need to take breaks, um, have some fun, smile, laugh, watch comedy, stand up comedy, whatever you need to do, um, because sometimes you can get in the funk when you're constantly applying to jobs. So be sure to take care of yourself mentally. As with applying the jobs as well. Yeah, and since we're talking about taking breaks, I think one good strategy could be to like set reminders on your phone, you know, to to take those breaks, like be active about it. Um, which I I understand it's it's hard sometimes to, um, you know, stick to it and give yourself a mental break from work, school, you know, that routine that you get into because you know we're at home. Um, most of us. So I do think it's important to always take breaks um, when possible. And like, um, I forgot who said it, but to, um, if you need help to reach out to your family, to your friends, um, you know, I think it's important to have that, um, you know, that structure there for you to help you when, when you need it. And for me, going out into nature, taking walks, that has been huge. Whenever I'm too in my head about a project or anything like that, and you feel really overwhelmed, just step outside for 20 minutes, for 15 minutes, whatever that looks like, you will feel so much better. I promise. That and then Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Instagram cat videos. That is what works for me. Find what works for you. <laughs> Uh, and that actually wraps our set questions that we had for our panel. I am seeing a couple of questions that came in, but please do go ahead and keep submitting your questions. We have a lot more time than I thought we would, so we can get to as many as we can. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to address this one because I think this is really important. And it talks about, um, so you're interested in public health, but you're not sure what to specialize in. So maybe you have a lot of different interests and you're not sure how to pick which one. Um, I would like to hear from our panelists if that has ever been your experience, if you weren't sure what to specialize in and what helped you make that decision. I can go ahead and start. I wasn't sure what type of public health or what graduate degree I was necessarily interested in. I went to a lot of the program websites and they have current students that are willing to talk and share about their experiences. So I sent them emails um, and just did a couple of calls just to get an idea, like, what is your classes like? What do you enjoy about the program? Simple questions to get to know them and their passions. And that kind of helped me narrow down what type of public health I was interested in. I would also say because we're in the age of webinars all the time and they're free, um, going to different webinars that have these different um, subject matter topics is, might be a great way to think about the different areas of public health, um, think about what you're really interested in and what you wouldn't mind doing for most of your life. <laughs> so go to those webinars, sign up for them. They're everywhere. Um, and if you need resources, let me know. 
I can totally relate to that question. As you all know now, my background, um, a lot of things, but public health until my internship. Um, so what I would advise for my experience is to think of at least three fields of interest that you um, that are interest to you and search for job openings in those fields. Um, you know, and this is where networking comes into play as well. You know, you try to reach out to as many people um, as you can to, you know, find those opportunities to learn more about those opportunities. And because just one experience like mine, you know, it can change your point of view and allow you to explore new interests. Interest. So don't be afraid to explore fields that you may not be as familiar with. Um, and so I think networking definitely help, still helping me, um, you know, search my path within public health now. Um, so those connections are important. Yeah, and I would also say, I think webinars are great. And I'm actually going to plug National Public Health Week a little bit here because there are so many webinars going on this week. So if you're watching this, you're on nphw.org right now. Um, if you look at the events tab, you will see all of these different events going on. There are webinars about COVID, about health equity, racial equity, any topic that you could think of, uh, someone is putting it on, I promise. So that is a great way uh, to look into that. And I would also say a lot of lived experience will also help you out. Like before it was mentioned volunteer opportunities. I think that's great. I was the queen of internships. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I did, I think my first internship was like in economics intern or so, like something that that is not me, <laughs> but I tried it out and I found out that I did not want to spend the rest of my life doing that. So, um, so networking definitely would come into play, but yeah, just getting as much experience as you can, if you can shadow somebody like a day in their life, like experiences like that are really important as well. All right, so I see a lot of great questions coming in. We sort of addressed this one before, but I know this is one that a lot of people are feeling, so I would like to talk about it again. And that's about staying motivated throughout the job application process. Um, and I actually have a, a quick tip to weigh in on this one. Don't be afraid to not apply I mean, apply for things that even if you don't think you're quite qualified, um, I, <laughs> I have done that many times with internships and I ended up getting them. So, I mean, if you can secure the interview, I mean, you would be surprised how far you can go, even if you don't hit all of the boxes, there's a way to spin any experience um, into fitting what the person is looking for. Um, so I encourage you to maybe expand upon what you thought you might want to be doing. Um, I know when I was first applying for jobs, I would initially say no to applying to a lot of things because I thought like, oh, that's, that's not what I want to do. Or like, oh, I have a clear path of what my life is going to look like and this is going to be a detour and I don't want a detour. Um, so I just encourage you to, to be open to different experiences because you never know where that might lead for you. Like Holly said, I would definitely say a lot of jobs are stepping stones. You're not going to get your dream job right out of grad school, or maybe you will. I kind of did, and then I had to readjust my goal. Um, but, you know, even with the, the job application process and things of that nature, staying motivated, um, things, I, I really looked at job interviews as a, a way to practice, too. Um, so like every, at the end of every interview, I would ask like, what could I have done better? What are you looking for? And a candidate, things of that nature. Um, and it would just help me be better for the next interview, whether or not I got it. Um, so looking at, at it as a learning opportunity and a process you just kind of have to go through. And then I know Latoya said having a good support system around you is extremely important. Um, so she could talk more about that because it's her idea. <laughs> So for me, uh, I got a lot of no's, like I said earlier, but I think one of the things that really helped is also to take breaks from applying to jobs because that's a job in itself. Um, I would also say having a good support system, like, you know, Soraya said, um, know who your friends are 
and you know piggyback ideas off of them have a group chat that descends posts linkedin everything so i think that is those two things are very important and like zariah said with the interview i was very surprised that i was able to land some of the positions that i did and also very surprised as well to get interviews to positions that I thought I was nowhere near ready for and although I didn't get those you know positions the questions always they always stay in my head now because it's like okay those are those are the type of people they're looking for that's the type of skills they're looking for so it's always a learning lesson even if you don't get the position that you want. Absolutely. And I also be open to the various roles. You know, manager at one location isn't a manager at an, isn't the same as other organizations. So being open, you know, not being picky about job titles, but look at the job description and getting an understanding of what the role truly is. So continue applying. I mean, it's, you know, I definitely got a lot of no's myself as well, and it's hard, but stay resilient and really think about your why. Like going back to why are you passionate about this and, you know, use that as a center of what you do. Definitely. I think something that helped me um, throughout this process was reaching out to like my circle first, you know, friends and family, um, career advisors, and looking at your school resources. For example, I know the University of Maryland has a platform called Career for Terps, where students and recent graduates can look at job openings and I actually found one of my first internships through that website. So, you know, you never know, keep an eye out for those resources that are available to you from your school. And so overall, you know, this process of job hunting can, can be draining, is draining, but don't be discouraged by rejection. Um, I like, you know, like we've all said, we've received a lot of those no emails, um, and it's frustrating, but you know, this may sound like a cliche, but you'll see that perseverance pays off for sure. And there's one more thing I wanted to add to. Um, I am a huge, like I love LinkedIn. I will go and search for people who have the same interests as me and, you know, look at their background. And if I'm bold enough, I will email them too right then and there. So, you know, just be very proactive about what you want. Yeah, those are really good points. Evelyn, you talked about like job boards at your school. That is a really good point. I found one of my internships that way. Um, I was just looking at it one day and it ended up, it was me and I think three other people who happened to apply to that internship and I got it. So you never know. I'm, a lot of people don't tend to look at places like that, but it's a great way to, to get yourself in the door for sure. And I agree about LinkedIn as well. Um, when I was really gutsy and really desperate for a job, I would look at job descriptions and see who the manager of that position was. And if I was feeling really get, uh, gutsy, I would find them on LinkedIn and send them a direct message of like, hey, this is why I would be really great for this role, would love to chat with you. And more often than not, it worked. And they would hop on a Zoom or hop on a call with me. So, so that's another um, thing that you all can explore. All right, seeing a lot of great questions come in. Ooh, this is a good one. And we, we kind of touched on this as well. Actually, I think, I think we answered that one. Ooh, this is a good one. How did you pick your grad school or program? What went into that decision for you all? What were the, the factors that was high on your list? I would love to hear from that experience. I can start. Um, for me, I was looking for graduate programs that had real world experiences. I wanted opportunities where I could network, but also um, have like an internship. So like um, University of Pittsburgh's MHA program has an extended residency option. So you have, you graduate with a year and a half of work experience, you work and um, do school at the same time. And that was very appealing for me. So primarily was looking for that extended learning opportunities and looked at the curriculum and that's how I made my decision.
for me, um, the masters wasn't as much of a choice. It was more, <laughs> I kind of just applied where I was um, because I wasn't really sure about the public health realm. And I kind of came to the scene a little late, um, but I did recently apply for my PhD. And within that, I, um, I was trying to find professors that have done work that I'm very interested in. I wanted to make sure that the cultural aspect of the uh, school was great and the environment was uh, friendly, collaborative, um, supportive. Like it wasn't a neck and neck competition with all the graduate students all the time type thing. I also uh, always consider um, the location, cost of living, things of that nature. I am a big budgeter, so <laughs> I budget like the entire move and everything. Um, but you you really have to kind of um, figure out what your priorities are and then um, research all of it, the classes, the methodology, uh, the people, the um, seeing what other students have researched and done their thesis or their dissertation on and who they were paired with and things of that nature. Um, but also considering, you know, we're in a pandemic, you might want to be close to home, you might want to get away, whatever your choice is, just uh, make sure that you prioritize the things that are most important to you and research all of those things. I'm seeing another question about search engines. So what search engines did you use to find jobs? Um, personally, for me, it was mostly LinkedIn. Last door and Indeed, but I will also say APHA has a job board, uh, and I looked up the URL just now. So hopefully, if if Lindsay's listening, you can drop it into the chat. But it is, I think, careers.apha.org/jobs. <laughs> so if you guys can remember that, that is another good place to look. Um, I'm not sure if any of our panelists have anything to add about good places to look for jobs. Um, I know DSTE, if you're interested in like epidemiology jobs and more data center jobs or, um, well, professor jobs after <laughs> your master's or your PhD and things of that nature, uh, CSTE is a really good source. And I use everything Holly just said. It was just basically everything under the sun that I can think of. Because I applied, I was in Tennessee and I applied everywhere. Now I'm in Arizona. So it was just more of a, Apply to everything. Um, don't not apply to something just because. Just apply to it. Also, go on to um, various companies that you're interested. Go on to their career page because a lot of them will give you the opportunity to like submit your resume, um, so they can contact you when a job comes up or set up alerts and. Um, that can be really helpful, just especially if you're passionate about a particular organization or are looking to stay in a certain area and you know what companies you're interested in. Yeah, thank you all so much. I think we actually hit all of the questions that were submitted. So if anybody else has any other questions, uh, we can field those with the last six or so minutes that we have. Um, but while we're waiting for any last minute questions to come in, I would love to leave us on a happy note uh, to go around to our panelists just to say, um, what are some of your big takeaways? What would you like to tell the new generation of public health? I'm actually seeing more questions come in, so never mind. <laughs> Maybe we can finish uh, on that if we have a little more time at the end. Um, okay, what skills did you learn in school that are the most valuable to you now? And what do you wish you knew more about? I think some of the most important skills I learned where number one, teamwork. Teamwork is so important. Public health is such a big field that anytime you work on something, you're gonna have to bring other people in. You can't be an expert in everything. So teamwork is really important. Um, and then I think one of the things that I wish I had more of, which you don't really get to have in school, is navigating ambiguity. Um, 
that is really important. I was the, I'm the first person in the role that I have right now. So when I came to my job, I was like, okay, what do I do? And they were like, TBD by you. And I was like, mm, I don't know about this. <laughs> so navigating ambiguity is really important and it helps you uh, grow your leadership skills as well. Yeah, to add to what Zariah said, team, you are always constantly working with teams in public health. Um, I, I would say for me, one of the skills that I did learn from school um, was actually the content of the courses. So like program management, um, program theory, those are really helpful to me when applying, um, when applying the skills that I needed for my jobs. And um, yeah, what was the, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the other things too but um what was the other part of that question the most valuable yeah so the most valuable thing that I would learn that I would want for my um my public health experience I would say one moment I am so sorry okay Yes. So I would say that the most valuable thing that I would like to put that I would like to tell other public health students is to be perseverant and um, don't don't succumb to the nose that you receive. I just wanted to say something um, real quick about the skills. Um, so for me, the most useful, I would say, that I learned was people skills and, uh, you know, including teamwork, all, it all falls into that, right? Um, because in school, you know, each group project that sometimes we're like, Ugh, no group projects, but, you know, for me, it was a learning um, experience and a great opportunity to build, to build relationships. And, you know, something that one of my supervisors once told me was that don't sell your soft skills short. They are as important as your hard skills. And so, in, you know, now in my professional career, I continue to build a rapport with uh, my supervisors and colleagues. And it's important because it makes um, my professional relationships with others mutually rewarding and productive. And you never know, people will remember you when positions are opened. I think we have time for one more if we go quickly. And I think this is a good one to leave on actually. How do you deal with rejection and how do you handle the waiting period after applying? Uh, and I can kick us off by saying, as hard as it is, don't take it personally. Uh, there are a lot of people applying to jobs right now, and that is why like finding a mentor, networking, all those things that we talked about are so critically important to get your foot in the door. I also continue to learn more about the organization and the job after I apply too. just like, you know, always prepping for like the next step and next step after you apply, right, is a potential interview. So like learning more about the organization, learning more about um, the work and projects, um, just trying to continue to educate myself. Yeah, for me, dealing with rejection, I, I would say I had a difficult time a little bit, um, but like, I, like we said before, I had a great support system. Um, and really just like looking for the next thing. I, I really, I didn't focus on my nose. I more so focused on what I wanna do, um, constantly adjusting and figuring out, um, is this really what I wanna do? Like Vanessa has been saying, going back to your why all the time, going back to your why should invigorate you to just keep on going. Um, Cause that is your purpose. That is, those are your values and those are your goals. Definitely. I mean, I think that it's hard for sure. I mean, it took me six, no, about eight months um, after graduating to get a job, an internship. <laughs> so like I said before, don't be discouraged by rejection. Um, and like Holly said, don't take it personal. Um, I think we 
we, you know, we have to build from that. You know, we all go through this process and it's important because it builds our skills to like, you know, I got this and focus on the positive things um, because it takes one person, you know, to give you that opportunity, that chance, and you never know what that will lead you. So, you know, just stay positive with this whole process because it is, like I said, draining, but, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen eventually. Yes. So don't, don't stay discouraged. And I would also just say really quick, um, don't take a rejection as a blow to your ego. Just realize that it was an objective, um, a, objective decision that happened. It doesn't, it's not personal towards you. Um, a lot of people don't get jobs. Um, if one person got the job and 500 uh, people applied, you're one of the 499 um, and it's not personal. All right, everyone, I'm looking at the time and it is 6.01 Eastern. So that is all the time that we have today, unfortunately. Thank you so much for listening and submitting all of your questions. I hope this was super helpful to you. Public health professionals are so critically needed right now. So wherever you end up in your career journey, we wish you all the best and happy National Public Health Week. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, everyone.